We had attempted to capture perhaps some of the entry aerodynamic testing that we were going to be doing with the shock wave on Columbia. And uh, this, of course, pictures us on the, uh, the morning breakfast before launch. And we tried to wear a different shirt each day so that we'd know just which attempt this was. And as I'm sure you'll recall, we went through, we went through five man-ups before we finally managed to launch. Uh, this is the actual morning that we finally did launch. We were getting very good at this procedure, walking out to the crew van. And, uh, and actually, we got very good at walking back from the crew van, too, I'm afraid. Bill Nelson, obviously very ready to go on this particular day. We manned up in the early morning darkness, aiming at a uh, 6 a.m. liftoff. We did lift off, uh, I think, about 6.55 in the morning. And uh, as a first-time guy, I'm, I must say that I thought uh, Hoot and the other experienced guys had me quite well prepared for what we were about to encounter. Um, you know, it seemed pretty calm and collected there until the main engines lit, and I got a slight glow off the, uh, from the outside, but when the solid rocket, rocket boosters ignited, uh, I knew that I was in for a, a rude awakening, that all my preparation, uh, you know, I don't know whether it was going to stand me in good stead or not. We uh, did the roll program and right away got an alarm. Uh, so that put me at ease because I thought right away, oh, it's just like being in the simulator, and that set the tone for the rest of the ascent. Uh, it was very, very impressive as a first-time uh, flyer. We lifted off in darkness and then started seeing sunlight almost right away when we got heads down. We finally got to an altitude of, of about 61 miles when we had the main engines cut off, and that was almost eight and a half minutes later. Uh, we did have only two alarms during the ascent. Both of them turned out to be uh, old sensors and no, no real big problem. The most impressive thing to me about the ascent from a, from a physical point of view was the, uh, the, the force that was exerted by, during the 3G throttle down close to the main engine cutoff. There you saw the solid rocket booster separation. Um, I had planned to do a lot of reach and visibility checks and uh, in feeling the force on my chest, I just said, well, forget about that. I'm going to sit here and enjoy the ride. Um, people that were at the Cape said that they thought the, the launch itself was spectacular. I guess the, the thing for me was uh uh, the impression of uh, first getting unstrapped from the seat and getting ready to the environment of, uh, of weightlessness. And uh, here are some scenes of uh, people just getting used to them, this new environment, which uh, was truly new for me and Charlie. Uh, and of course, uh, on the first day, the first thing that we had to do was kind of get our minds uh, set for the uh, deploying of the satellite that we had to do later on that day. What you see here out the window, out the back window, is of course the familiar uh, sun, sun shield that later on gets open and the satellite uh, in, inside of it is uh, made to spin. And here are some of the uh, operations uh, in the cabin getting ready to, to launch that satellite. It really is a coordinated uh, team effort even though Pinky and I were the uh, primary, uh, had our primary responsibility to deploy the satellite, it really is a team effort. Uh, the, the orbiter has to be precisely pointed in just the right attitude and with no uh, motion uh, so that the satellite does, doesn't uh, get an additional kick in a, in a wrong direction. And uh, Pinky and I work together, uh, everybody backs everybody else, and of course the satellite uh, is uh, released in, in a spinning motion which uh, maintains, uh, allows it to maintain the, the orientation that the orbiter imparts it. We were, um, we, we were looking for any uh, signs or any telltale uh, signs of, of uh, wobbling in the satellite, and of course we found none. We uh, kept tracking that satellite with the cameras and uh, zooming in and out uh, in, in, the, in the nozzle portion of the satellite to make sure that there was no uh, uh, indications or any signs of wobbling in the satellite and, and it was just steady as a rock. And uh, of course, uh, a timer is set as soon as the satellite uh, leaves the, the cargo bay that uh, will ignite the PKM motor later on on the other side of the Earth. Hoot had mentioned the number of uh, getaway special canisters we had on board. It was 13, and they were all controlled with this uh, controller that you see me holding in my left hand. And what we do is to set the status of a variety of different relays which apply power and, and make functions happen for the different getaway special cans, three of which were the uh, ultraviolet astronomy experiment, which uh, you may remember from our pre-flight conference I was quite interested in. As uh, Franklin mentioned in connection with the SATCOM deployment, the UVX is also a team effort and uh, it required one of us to operate the uh, controller and, and one of us to make sure that whoever was operating the controller did it right and then Hoot and Charlie, you see here in the forward flight deck, had to point 
the orbiter and therefore the telescope in the proper direction uh, so that we could take the data. And, and we're all looking forward to uh, getting a report on how that went. Of course, all that data is recorded on board, and uh, so we're not sure yet exactly how much data we were able to uh, take for the experimenters. We had a number of other space science experiments to do on board. On the first day, we started up the uh, material science laboratory and uh, got it running. It was pretty much an autonomous uh, machine, ran throughout the flight, or it was supposed to run throughout the flight. Another of our projects was to try and uh, take some photographs of Halley's Comet. Unfortunately, the photomultiplier that we had to do that uh, was not working. Uh, we attempted to, to take some photographs. Unfortunately, uh, due to our orbit and uh, the orbit lighting, we were unsuccessful at ever seeing the comet. Yeah, one of the other things we were doing is shown right here. Charlie and I, uh, Charlie did most of the operation on the IRIE camera while I was looking out the window and watching on the monitor, which is up in the corner and you can't really see it too well there. Uh, watching the scenes out the window and especially Hoot was helping out here a lot looking down to see, compare what we were seeing on the ground, because when you're looking in the IR on the monitor, it doesn't look like the real world, and trying to direct Charlie is where to point the thing. You take a lot of viewing of the world, and we had some time on this flight to do some pretty extensive Earth observations. We obtained a number of pictures that, it, that had never been taken from, uh, from space before, places on the Earth. And uh, as, a, as a veteran, I can tell you, you never get tired of seeing the world. This is the Irrawaddy River Delta down in Thailand, and the city of Rangoon there is just to the, on the eastern side of there. And then we continue a pass. We had some very rare passes over Southeast Asia where the, the weather was unusually clear. Got some fantastic and unique pictures of that. This, this was a shot coming up on the, uh, this is the west coast of Australia that's coming up here, and this is the Beagle Islands. We were always interested in watching the Beagle Islands because it seemed like uh, every time we'd come by there, we'd have uh, internal waves that we could see in the water. And we were looking at some the day that we shot this 16 millimeter. Unfortunately, they don't reproduce in the 16, but we uh, nevertheless got quite a few good uh, 70 millimeter photos showing a lot of wave action ha happening around these islands and uh, off the, the western coast of Australia. This was a shot uh, made later in the flight coming across the Indian subcontinent and uh, looking north into the Tibetan Plateau and across the, the Himalayan mountains. We did get a number of 70 millimeter still shots of the rare clear days over the Himalayas, but it's an absolutely awe-inspiring sight. I'm drifting across the, the Himalayas at five miles a second and, and to see no clouds in sight. An interesting thing to me about Earth observations was being a pilot, it it seemed visually like you were flying in a regular airplane, you know, at 41,000 feet or so. Uh, the one thing that reminded you of where you were was the fact that, for example, crossing the United States in 10 minutes. Uh, I had never been in an airplane that could do that. So that was the one thing that gave you the rude awakening that you were way up there. This is an area in the world uh, near New Caledonia and is typical of the kinds of uh, coral atolls that you can see, particularly in the South Pacific. Uh, Pinky had mentioned as a, as a veteran that, that you never get tired of looking out the window. And I guess my observation, um, based on having flown previously, was that, that not only do you not get tired, but the second time you do it with uh, uh, an experience, I think, which, which uh, uh, tends to produce perhaps uh, better better data the second time. Uh, you, you learn a bit more about how to do the task of Earth observations and you learn a bit more about what the Earth looks like and, and it was surprising to me how uh, easy it was for me to recognize different features of the world that, that I had had difficulty with on my first flight. There's a Horn of Africa and it was sort of interesting for me to, that after a few days all these things become so familiar having never been overseas and I, I used to tell myself what a way, what a way to go overseas. A lot of uh, activities uh, in cabin, uh, you can see that uh, everybody's doing something here and a, a lot of the stuff that we uh, tried to, to set up was uh, to have one person, for example, uh, be in charge of uh, loading all the cameras and making sure that the cameras were uh, ready to go and, and had the proper exposure set and all that. And uh, that was my job. Uh, 
I was supposed to uh, keep all the cameras uh, in good shape. And uh, here is uh, the loading of some of the 16-millimeter uh, film in the Aeroflex camera. And uh, by God, we, we shot uh, every bit of film that we had. Uh, Franklin did a great job, except he let us run out of film by the end. <laughs> yeah, by the time uh, we ended up the, the mission, we were uh, down, down to the black and white 35-millimeter uh, film. I might mention we had a brief shot there of uh, Congressman Bill Nelson on the mid-deck. Bill was just as busy as he could be every single time that anyone passed through the mid-deck, and uh, we, we probably omitted Bill a little bit during the movie, but we have quite a few slides that we're going to ask Bill to address uh, once we get out yeah, of the in, movie. In, in that last scene, he, uh, he conscripted a little help from me with one of his experiments to do, do some eye-hand coordination which is over and above the original experiment, uh, DSO, which I was involved in, which was the uh, Otter Goggles. It was a, uh, it's one of the things they're trying to examine to decide whether or not there is indeed, what the relationship is between the space adaptation syndrome and, and how we could possibly train people for it. And uh, unfortunately, we had a little problem with the goggles early on in the mission, but in this scene, Pinky and I uh, disemboweled it and, uh, and put it back together and it got it working again so we could continue with the experiment. Every time you have a new vehicle, uh, we're interested in seeing how it expands and contracts uh, when it gets into space. So what uh, we're doing right here is actually conducting cabin measurement. We measure the separation between the lockers, the distance between the floor and the ceiling, and everything else of that nature. And we do that on each new vehicle. So Columbia was kind of considered a new vehicle this time, and we, we redid the cabin measurements. Bill Nelson had a treadmill test that he was going to be running on uh, the last day of the mission, and uh, we a few of the rest of us managed to use the treadmill during the flight, and that was a quick shot of me getting a few minutes on it. On my first flight, uh, you may uh, remember we had Charlie Walker and his Cephas machine, which goes in place of the galley. So one of the nice additions to 61C, at least as far as I was concerned from the habitability point of view, was uh, a galley, which makes food preparation a lot uh, nicer task, particularly with uh, a seven-person crew. In addition, uh, since I had previously flown on a crew that was slightly smaller, I learned that that mealtime takes some amount, some amount of uh, innovation and adaptation to find a place to eat where you're not in somebody's way. And so we took some pictures just to show you where different people elected to eat and uh, didn't seem to be in the same place every day. We uh, did try to eat together as a crew, at least uh, for the evening meal. And uh, that seemed to work very well and it was a nice time uh, for us to review what had happened during the day and and to discuss what was, was coming up next, which always seemed to me to be re-entry. It seemed like we were always talking about re-entry. <laughs> you can see Bob found a, a comfortable corner in which to, to stuff himself there where uh, he was able to keep most of his food under control. Of course, I wasn't always trying to. And this was a pretty good spot. Uh, you, what you really needed was some place you could jam yourself in and, and hold still to get through the meal. Cabin stow was something we got to practice uh, about, started practicing at about midway through the mission. <laughs> and we got pretty good at it. I guess this is Steve trying to battle there with one of the cables. We thought we had given you what we hoped was pretty decent in-cabin TV, and we apologized for the lack of in-cabin TV for the last two or three days, but we had stowed the, cabin, the, the camera away, uh, so we didn't break it back out again. After 300 uh, hours of space flight, uh, you can really learn how to adapt yourself to zero G and, and, and do the tasks a lot more rapidly than, than uh, you ever could on the ground. And, and most of the things like stowing in the cabin were, were really no problem at all. With some exceptions. Almost all. <laughs> Cables develop a mind of their own. <laughs> this helps you understand why we didn't break the camera and beg out. <laughs> the real difficulty of this scene was holding the camera still while he was trying not to giggle at Steve. <laughs> I had no interest in getting that out again after. <laughs> this is another activity that we really did spend quite a bit of time doing with our three, three practice attempts to uh, deorbit and land. Uh, was cleaning the cabin up. We uh, tried to make sure that we retur returned a, a relatively clean orbiter when we came back down to land. And this shows uh, uh, Steve and Franklin and uh, Bob and Charlie cleaning the bird up and trying to get some of our coffee stains and things like that off the orbiter so we could bring them back a relatively nice bird. 
thing that's really amazing to me was the fact that, uh, you know, having been on an, on an aircraft carrier for brief periods of time, uh, Hoot and I being associated with the Naval Service, it's like being in a city. You know, it, it doesn't look like that, but it really is. We're, uh, I guess the third time was the charm for us. We had tried to get down and tried to get down, and finally this was real entry morning. Um, we were able to catch a final glimpse out the, the back windows of another uh, sun, I think this was a sunrise, right over the vertical tail. Uh, you can't see it very well, but we had the uh, shuttle imaging uh, infrared lee side test stuff up on the pod. This is actually the landing itself. Uh, the entry was spectacular. Unfortunately, there wasn't a whole lot that we could film on the landing uh, because it was all dark, so the only, the only uh, footage that we had was when the orbiter actually came within view of the, uh, the big lights down on the ground, our xenon lights. Uh, touchdown was about 1,500 feet down the runway at Edwards. Uh, the, the orbiter was very smooth handling, very nice and responsive. Uh, the uh, nose gear steering was used a little bit through the landing roll. Uh, not, a, not a very big input, but just a little bit of nose gear steering prior to brake application. We got on the brakes just below 140 knots, uh, held a uh, relatively constant 8 feet per second squared deceleration rate uh, until we got wheel stop. I guess we used something like 11,500 feet uh, of the runway in getting stopped. Uh, we understand that we perhaps had a little bit of brake chipping on the right outboard brake, but other than that, we don't have a whole lot of reports of brake damage, so I think the uh, the brakes people are relatively pleased with how the, uh, how the brakes held up and how the wheels and tires made out on this. Uh, we came popping out probably about 45 minutes after touchdown. Uh, the cabin was a little bit warm by the time we got out, so the cold morning desert air at 32 degrees felt real nice to me. And uh, I think all of us were happy to be back on the ground again, uh, even though space flight is a, a wonderful experience and we enjoyed it. After all the practice attempts to get down, we were happy to be back.